We read this morning from the Gospel of John in chapter 13. John's Gospel in chapter 13. Let's share the word of God. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know who I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Let's turn the, to the passage that we read earlier from John chapter 13. We've been seeking to le learn from the life of Simon Peter for some weeks now, and uh, today we come to the incident recorded here. In the Gospel of John, we have what some scholars call the Book of Signs, because John calls Jesus' miracles signs. And they are signs because they are significant and they point uh, to something far greater and far more wonderful than the miracle uh, itself. And then in chapters 13 through 21, uh, scholars call this the book of glory because it is the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and especially the glory of his cross that is the focus of those particular chapters. And when you look at what John does here in these opening verses of the book of glory, this second part of, of John's gospel, you see that John places a great deal of emphasis upon Jesus' love. That's evident because in the first 12 chapters of the gospel of John, the verb or the noun love occurs just eight times. But then in just these chapters 13 through 17, the word love occurs 30 times. Uh, so it seems clear that John wants us to focus here upon the love of the Lord Jesus. So that's what we're going to do first. We're going to look at the loving Saviour, the loving Saviour. He wants us to see first the steadfastness of Jesus' love. Look at verse 1. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, 
he loved them to the end. Now, verse 1 is almost a statement that can be thought of as heading up and introducing everything that follows in John's Gospel from, from this point, right through to the end of chapter 21, that it's an introduction of that whole second section of the Gospel. And notice how he puts it here, the hour. The hour of Jesus was uh, really the hour of the cross. He will depart from this world to the Father by way of the cross. And then notice the way he introduces the love of Jesus. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the last or to the end. Jesus, he says, is going to pass out from this world to the Father, but he has loved his own who were in the world. Jesus says to his disciples in chapter 16, in the world you will have tribulation. He knows what his people have here. And he loves his whole own who are in the world. And he loves them there. He knows where his people are. And then you have this climactic statement at the end of the verse. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Which can be translated in a couple of ways. And it can be understood in a couple of ways. Literally it is, he loved them to the end, but that can be construed in two ways. It can be understood in terms of time. He loved them all the way to the end, that is time-wise, and especially the stress seems there upon his love for his people in giving himself up for them on the cross. He loved them to the end, to the last, all the way to the cross. Or it can be understood as an adverb, that is, he loved them to the nth degree, we might say. He loved them to the maximum, and the NIV really is plumbing for that and draws out the sense of that when it translates it, he showed to them the full extent of his love. How does he do that? He does that as the second part of this gospel shows us by laying down his life for the sheep. He loved them to the end, utterly, to the end degree. The steadfastness of Jesus' love. But then we have to ask, does that statement then apply specifically and exclusively to Peter and to his fellow disciples present on that occasion? Or is this written in relation to all subsequent disciples, down to our own time? And surely it must be said of all his disciples, down to ourselves, don't we have here a, a statement of the abiding disposition of Jesus to his own people in the world now? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end in both senses of that word. And the steadfastness of Jesus' love, he does not leave, he does not abandon his people Having loved his own who are in the world, he has loved them to the end, to the very last. But then not only the steadfastness of his love, but there's a sadness connected to it here in this introduction. Did you notice that in verses 2 and 3? They're not a, a complete statement, really. They are actually another kind of introduction. If verse 1 introduces everything from chapter 13 to the end, verses 2 and 3 are a sort of introduction to this scene of the foot washing that takes place in chapter 13. And I need to make a couple of comments here about the text. Uh, quite literally, the text goes, while supper was going on, the devil, having already determined that Judas of Simon Iscariot should betray him, Jude, Jesus, knowing uh, that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. And then it continues in, in uh, verses 4 and 5. There's real sadness in that. If you use the translation that I've got here, the New King James or the authorised version, then the text is translated slightly differently, you will have noticed. You'll have it that the devil, having put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. And it can be translated that way, but I suspect that the reference to the heart in that text is actually uh, 
referring to the devil himself. In other words, the devil having determined in his own heart. It's an idiom, it's a figure of speech that indicates a decision that's been taken, a determination that's been made. And I think it's more natural than to take that as, uh, as the, the meaning here in the text. The devil having determined. It's the devil's decision to have Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, betray him. And then the timing, verse 2, should read, while supper was going on. Some texts take the Greek to mean that supper was finished, but I think the text here is a present tense, meaning whilst the supper was continuing. And that underlines this terrible sadness. Notice the important little connection there. Notice that verse 2, in verse 2, Judas is going to betray him. And then notice in verse 3 how utterly pointless that deed of betrayal is going to be ultimately because we're told in verse 3 that Jesus knows that the Father has given all things into his hands that Jesus has sovereignty over everything he has all the kingdoms that the devil once offered to him as if he had the right to offer them but the Father has determined to place everything into his hands. Do you worry sometimes that the devil has made you a particular focus for his hostility and his enmity? You see, here the devil determining certain things, deciding certain things. But we also see here it makes no difference because the Father has already given all things into the hands of Jesus. He has all authority and power. So here is Judas's deed in verse 2, but a sovereign decision has already been made that we are told of in verse 3. And the treachery of Judas is not going to change the events that have already been sovereignly determined by God. So whilst it appears decisive from a human point of view, Judas' deed is actually powerless to overthrow what God has already determined. But the thing I particularly want you to notice there is in that opening phrase of verse 2 where it says, and during supper. And I think John wants us to understand that what takes place here, the foot washing, takes place during supper and that Judas was there at the time when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. That, I think, is the real sadness. There are some people who may be very near to the love of Jesus and yet have no part in it. There are some, and it seems they don't care whether they stand under the shadow of Jesus' love or Jesus' judgment. It's just not a big issue to them, so long as they can keep on text messaging or whatever. It just doesn't matter. And that is a terribly sad condition to be in and this is a sad episode here Judas was there what do you think was going through Judas mind as Jesus was washing his feet what do you think was surging through his thoughts at that time he knew the arrangements he had made what do you think it was going through his mind in those moments when Jesus knelt before him and washed his feet I keep pressing this on you when it comes up in various texts because I don't know your hearts and I can't read another man's heart. But I have to take it that if this is how it was in the original band of disciples, then in any congregation of God's people, there may be this kind of person there as well. People who in some way may be very close, very near to Jesus and yet not want any part of his love. And so I press it on you when the issue arises. Do you sense the sadness in it? Do you see how sad this is? Judas would later leave this place, and he would leave walking away to do his wicked deed on feet that Jesus had washed. And then notice the shock the shock in Jesus' love. Verses 4 and 5, um, the, 
In verses 4 and 5, we we get to the end of the sentence that begins in verse 2. And it says, uh, Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. That's a surprising and a shocking thing. It's shocking in its timing, for one thing. You see in verse 4, he rises from supper. That is, whilst the meal is going on, Jesus rises and begins to carry out this washing of the disciples' feet, and that just wasn't the time to do it. Most of you know that this is something ordinarily done at the beginning, when people arrive at house. You can read about it in any commentary on this passage of Scripture. There was a regular expected routine that took place. People might go for a celebration and they would have bathed before leaving uh, home and wearing sandals on dusty roads. Their feet would have become uh, dirtied as they travelled to the other house. Uh, So a kind and thoughtful host would provide water for you to wash your feet when you arrived at the home and so on. And if he was wealthy, he would have a servant to carry out that task of washing the feet of his guests. But on this occasion, no one had done it there that evening. And that's why Jesus did this with such bad timing. He got up from supper. And the action itself was surprising. Washing feet, as I said a moment ago, was slaves' work. In fact, there were some Jewish teachers who taught that Jewish slaves ought not to be required to wash other people's feet because it was too demeaning to require that of a Jewish slave. Gentile slaves should do it, but Jewish slaves should be exempt. It was beneath their dignity, even as slaves. But Jesus does it. Rising from supper, he laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a bowl and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel with which he was girded. So it's shocking in the sense that he does this. Now, you might be wondering, well, why didn't one of the other disciples do it? Why didn't they, when they arrived, take on this task? And we know the reason why. It's because in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, we're told at that very moment, the disciples were disputing amongst themselves, quarreling about which of them was the greatest. They were squabbling, and they were all vying and jockeying for position and prominence. So they were in no mood at all to do anything so menial and servile as washing one another's feet. There was no way they were going to do it. But Jesus does it. Wrapping a towel around himself, there he knelt. And with the dirt of Thomas and Philip and John and Matthew and Judas on the towel, he washed their feet. Jesus did that. And it's all the more amazing because of verse 3. We have just read that Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. And now those hands that have all authority and power given to them are washing the filthy feet of disciples. Do you see how shocking that is? His is the stature of God's Son, to whom all things have been made subject, and yet he stoops this low. But you see, as he knows his status, he doesn't have to be concerned like the disciples to be jockeying for the number one position. But he stoops. He's got no need to defend his status. But isn't there something wonderful in the way Jesus stoops in his love? The Father has given all things into his hands, all authority in heaven and earth, all power and all dominion. But he stoops down to those same hands and with those same hands washes the feet of the disciples. The shock of his love. Now, let me just urge you to stop at that moment before we move on. Because if you're anything like me, as you approach passages of scripture you'll have this tendency if you're not careful to rush on and to say oh I know what Jesus is teaching us here I know what we're supposed to learn from this event and so on so we can rush on to chapter 13 and learn uh, to verse 13 and learn about that but we shouldn't be so concerned to learn 
so concerned to learn that we forget to worship. And this morning I want you to stop yourself from running on to verse 14 of this chapter, to stop right here and to look at what Jesus is doing and to adore him for a love that stoops down to serve his people. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6 says, He did not regard equality with God as something to use for his own advantage, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being found in the likeness of men. And when he was found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. This is Jesus who stoops. And you're never going to want to imitate him as a disciple unless you first bow before him and adore him for what he is as a loving saviour. A loving saviour and a learning disciple. Because here within hours of his death, the Saviour patiently deals with his disciples and he's instructing them and concerned to address Peter's problems and difficulties particularly. And the first problem that Peter had, of course, was his ignorance. Verses 6 and 7. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Notice the emphatic pronouns there, Lord. Are you going to wash my feet? Given who Jesus is, Peter's got a big problem with Jesus stooping to do the work of the lowliest servant washing feet. He couldn't grasp that. And you may wonder, well, why couldn't he grasp that? Well, haven't we seen? Peter saw this one walking on water. Peter saw Jesus transfigured so that his divine glory shone out through the veil of his flesh. Peter knows who this is. And he's not going to allow Jesus to do this. And so Jesus' response is a clear declaration of Peter's ignorance. What I am doing you do not understand. Peter, you don't understand. You'll know afterwards. You'll know about this afterwards. You'll understand it afterwards. What does he mean afterwards? Well, he might be referring to after verse 13, where Jesus explains what it is that he's trying to do you. Or it may mean after my work on the cross. All this will become clear to you. But whatever it means precisely, there's a principle here that we always need to be carrying around with us. Because this is not just for Peter. But there are those times when Jesus just perplexes us and we do not understand what to make of him or what to make of his dealings with us. We just don't know what he's doing. But he has a way of providing a proper perspective at a later point in time for us. And verse 7 for you this morning may be just what you need in your circumstances. Who, who knows just how it is Jesus is at work, even now in your own life and experience. Perhaps even now you are swamped by a conundrum of his ways with you and you just cannot figure out what he's doing. And perhaps you need to hear Jesus saying, not only to Peter, but to you, what I'm doing, you do not know now, but you will know afterwards. Jesus addresses the problem of Peter's ignorance He's saying, Peter, you've got to trust me on this. And is he saying that perhaps to you? You've got to learn to trust me, even when you don't understand what's happening. And then secondly, Jesus addresses the problem of Peter's defilement. Verses 8 through 11. In verses 8 and 9, Jesus says that Peter and every other disciple needs a decisive cleansing in verse 8, Peter makes this emphatic refusal. You will never, ever wash my feet. That's the strength of what Peter says there. And then Peter is met with Jesus' direct and clear answer to that. If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. 
Notice that Jesus doesn't say, if I don't wash your feet. He says, if I don't wash you. As if he's saying, my washing of your feet, Peter, is, is meant to be symbolic. It points to my washing of you. And you need to be washed. Well, what is he referring to? This happens before the cross, but it probably has the cross in view. And it's as if Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, if I don't wash and cleanse you through my coming work on the cross, you have no part with me. You need a decisive cleansing. Well, when he puts it that way, Peter responds, of course, with a sort of reverse gusto, doesn't he? And he says, well, they're not my feet only, but my head and my hands as well. We sometimes think Peter's impetuous, don't we, and excitable, and an immature disciple. And so often he seems to get the wrong end of the st stick, and he swings from one extreme to another. But don't be so quick to judge Peter here. Perhaps he understands more than maybe you do. Because when Peter said that, he didn't... Uh, when Peter said that he didn't need to be washed and, and that Jesus said that he that, uh, said what he did, that unless Peter was washed by Jesus, he had no part with him, then at least Peter responds with a sort of gut instinct, doesn't he? And wash my head and my hands too. Because Peter understands that more important than anything else is that he must have a part with Jesus. He must have fellowship with Jesus. He must. And Jesus is saying that for that to be true, Peter must have this decisive cleansing that comes through his cross. But there's another application of that in verses 10 and 11, because Jesus seems to be teaching that his disciples also need an ongoing cleansing. Jesus says there in verse 10, He who is bathed, needs only to wash his feet. What's he saying? Well, it's a second application. The reason why the feet needed to be washed so often is because even if people had already bathed, perhaps going to a party or something, it's, it's, they've travelled across town, they've been walking in the dust with sandals and their feet have got dirty. And so even though they've bathed when they've arrived at the other house or whatever, their feet would be dirty and the host would provide a servant to wash the feet. You didn't need another bath. You were already clean, but you need to wash your feet. You just needed to wash off the defilement you pick up along the way. And Jesus uses that as a picture to highlight the fact that Peter needed an ongoing cleansing. And not only Peter, but you and me too. That's the idea that the Apostle John presses on us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, where he says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship with one another. There is an ongoing fellowship. Fellowship is maintained. And the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. That's the promise to believers in Jesus who are in fellowship with him. There is a defilement. Certain sins that we pick up along the road and it needs to be cleansed. And Jesus' death makes provision for that too. And you'll see just how much this matters. If as a Christian, you see just how much defilement you pick up along the way. I cannot even pray without sinning. To engage in the holiest exercise of a disciple of Christ, it's not possible to do that without sinning, without being defiled in the very action have you ever been praying and as you've gone along, you've found that your mind begins to wander? And there you are, you have the privilege of an audience with the King of Heaven and you're speaking to Him and you're bringing your cares to Him and you're bringing your adoration to Him and your mind has slipped into neutral, but you've carried on. So you cannot even pray without sinning. My feet are defiled and I need to be washed again by my Saviour. And when we come to him day by day, as we ought, we need to ask him, Lord, you need to wash my feet again. I'm defiled again. 
And then he speaks about the problem of Peter's pride, verses 12 to 17. It's Jesus teaching again. He's returned to his seat, his couch, and resuming his place. He says, now do you see what I've done? Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. And then he makes this point in verses 14 and 15. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Moments earlier, the disciples had been arguing, hadn't they? As to who was the greatest among them. And so right at that point, Jesus gives them this appropriate word. Do you see how this stooping of Jesus is so great? This great act of condescension of Jesus in verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I've done slaves' work for you, he's saying. It's a challenge to their pride, and no doubt the disciples are shocked that he he should do this. Because condescension, rightly done, is always impressive leaving thoughts of Jesus aside just for a moment, you know how in ordinary life, how impressive it is when someone of rank and importance appears to genuinely condescend to serve ordinary folk. That's impressive. Well then, how much more impressive is it when the Lord Jesus Christ, our teacher and Lord, does slaves work for us, does what nobody else is willing to do, that night, their Lord and teacher washed their feet. And then notice what Jesus says. That would have no doubt caught them off guard. Verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash my feet. No, he doesn't say that, does he? You ought to wash one another's feet. It's easy to wash Jesus' feet, isn't it? But that's not the application here. He says instead that the way to show esteem and devotion to him is the way in which you show care and service to his people, to one another. And that's a real barb in our pride, isn't it? That really sticks in us. Here you are in a congregation and perhaps there's a person in this congregation and you've watched them for a while and you don't really know them. Uh, but from a distance it looks as, though, looks as though they rate themselves and they perhaps seem a little bit full of themselves and it begins to grate on you after a while and you hardly know them at all but a bad attitude can begin to develop in your heart towards them. And your pride begins to feed on that. And your pride feeds upon mere imagination of what you think that other person is like. Even though you've never taken time to get to know them. That's, that can be a real problem. And then there's another problem if we're to serve others of the Lord's people as our Lord teaches us here. Washing their feet, humbly serving them. And that is that a good number of them are pretty difficult and obnoxious. And that's not just imagination, is it? The reason why you think some Christians are obnoxious is because they are. That's what we are like. And the way you seek to show your devotion to Jesus is through seeking to serve them and care for them. And then very quickly our time has gone. Jesus Addresses here the matter of Peter's faith. Verses 18 and 19. This is where a cloud comes on the horizon with the reference to the betrayer. He's already been hinted at in verses 10 and 11, but now it comes out in verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. So not all of them are his disciples, Jesus says. And then he says, verse 18, But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. It's a reference to the time in 
in the original quotation, when King David was betrayed by a close and intimate colleague, it is uh, probably a reference to Ahithophel that we read of in 2 Samuel 15, 16 and 17, who betrays Jesus and helps in a rebellion against, uh, sorry, betrays David and helps in a rebellion against him as king. But here David, the covenant king of Israel, is suffering betrayal by a close friend. And now the supreme covenant king, Jesus, will experience a similar betrayal. But notice verse 19. Now I tell you before it comes to pass, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Jesus says, I'm telling you this before it happens, so that it will happen. Uh, When it happens, you will remember that I told you beforehand about this, and you can believe that I am he. I am he. Now that is exactly how God speaks of himself in the prophecy of Isaiah. And Jesus is taking up the same terminology here. It is actually a claim to be the true God. Jesus himself is claiming this. How do I know that? Well, if I tell you something ahead of time, uh, when, when it takes place, Jesus says, you may know that I am he. One of the key arguments in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 48, is how do you know who the true God is? in view of all these idols and false gods of other nations? And the answer is that years ahead of time, the true God, the living God, can accurately predict events, and they come to pass. Pagan gods can't do that. So, for example, in in the prophecy of Isaiah, in chapter 41, we read God challenging the idols. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or evil that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing and your work is nothing. And he who chooses you chooses an abomination. You see, he's challenging these so-called gods. You tell us what's going to happen in the future. And then again in chapter 46, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do my pleasure. He goes on to speak about Cyrus, actually naming Cyrus 150 years ahead of time. Therefore, who is he? He is the true God, the living God, who predicts what will happen because it will fulfill his purpose. He will bring it to pass. Now, Jesus does the same here with Peter and with his fellow disciples. He cushions Peter from the coming crushing disappointment. The disciples will be scattered. They're going to come into incredible disillusionment. Their hopes are going to crash down into the dust. And it'll all be brought about, it seems, by a brutal betrayal, by a close friend. That can have a tremendous impact on people tremendously affect us. Judas, a preacher of the gospel, healing the sick, casting out evil spirits. This one is going to be the betrayer, a familiar friend. And the loving Savior knows what impact such a betrayal can have upon us. And here we see him shielding Peter from some of the stumbling blocks and the temptations that could damage his faith, he regulates the impact and the intensity of it upon his disciples. The loving Savior, instructing his disciple, addressing his ignorance, addressing his defilement, speaking to his pride, strengthening his faith, and in so doing, addressing your ignorance and addressing your defilement and speaking to your pride, and strengthening your faith. The Lord bless his word to us this morning.